Welcome to Chapter 5 of Writing Logically and Thinking Critically, The Language of Argument, Definition. In this chapter, we will learn to consider the abstract nature of language and hence the need for clear definitions and concrete examples, the difference between connotative and denotative meaning, to be aware and beware of euphemisms, and how to define terms using appositives. Let's think about definitions and how they control perception. In our textbook, Willis reminds us, find out who controls the definitions, and you have a pretty good clue who controls everything else. Nowhere is the precision of language more important than in politics, yet nowhere is meaning more likely to be manipulated. It's political season right now, um, we have a lot of political ads running on television. Democratic and Republican debates are taking place. And you can listen to these and see how language gets manipulated. We learn that our use of language reflects our bias. The book uses the definition of the word macho, and we learn that that definition depends on who you ask. American feminists think of macho as someone who is boorish or counter-domestic. But in Mexico, machismo is akin to gravitas. It is a man who takes care of the people who depend upon him. So we learn language can reflect cultural bias and political bias. If you look at further definitions provided in the book, work is something men do as distinguished from housework or childcare. Art is what men produce and crafts are what women and ethnic minorities do. It's also important to note that definitions change to reflect new ways of thinking. For example, the definition of alcoholism changed from criminal behavior to a disease. And once it had been classified as a disease, we started to have treatments that were very helpful for people who were trying to recover from that disease. Homosexuality stopped being classified in the DSM as an illness. So that was also very liberating. Um, they used the definition of elite which used to mean one who had education, taste, talent, wealth, and or power, and it's now used to denigrate liberals, as in, oh, you're just a liberal elite. When meanings shift, it can both reflect and influence changes in the culture at large. Let's shift our gears a little bit and talk about language. So it's important to know that language is an abstract system of symbols. The word is not the thing, but a signifier used to represent the thing we refer to. For example, if I decided to call a pencil a fork, and we all decided that that would be the case, then a pencil would be called a fork. There is no ideal thing where we are informed about what something should be called. It is completely arbitrary. It is by chance that we call things the way we call them. Take a look at the slide of the word cat, and then the picture of the cat, and then a real cat. So even the word cat and the picture of the cat is not the thing, but a signifier used to represent the thing. Meaning is made only when the signified is processed through the mind of someone receiving the words. And we will all have slightly different life experiences that will inform how we view language. Meaning is dependent not only on the individual, but also on the context, the situation, and the interpretive community, or the language community. The book gives you the example of the word host. Host will mean one thing if I'm speaking in a religious context. Host will mean another thing if I am talking to some medical personnel. And host will mean a third thing if I'm talking to someone at a party. Individual experience and perception will always deny the word complete stability because things move and change depending on uh, how we're using the word in context. The assignation of a particular meaning to a given term remains essentially arbitrary. In other words, it is by chance. If the symbolic representation of concrete visible objects is unstable, think of how problematic abstract terms must be. When we think of abstract terms, we want to think of words like love and um, you know, meaning, and, and those words that don't refer to concrete objects like tables, chairs, forks, and pencils. So in order to be clear in our writing and in our argument, we need to understand the abstraction ladder. There was a different example of this in your book, but it, this is essentially the same thing. 
So we deal with the most abstract concept at the top of the ladder, and we come down to the most concrete example of that idea. So the first rung of the ladder, we have the word material. Now material could be anything, metal, wood, yarn, cloth, any material. When we move down to the next uh, rung of the ladder, we have instrument of war. Again, that could be many things. It could be tanks, it could be words, it could be guns, and so on. We move down one more rung of the ladder, and now we have weapon. Well, now we know it could be a gun, or a knife, or a bomb. We move down one more rung on the ladder, we're getting even more specific. Now we have a rifle, but we also know there are many different types of rifles. And then when we get to the final rung of the ladder, the one closest to the ground, our most concrete example, is an M16A2 rifle. So now we have a very specific example of what we are talking about. Please turn to page 103 and complete exercise 5B. Please post your answer to the discussion board called exercise 5B in module 5. You should post it as inline text and not as an attachment. Let's talk about abstractions and evasions. Sometimes people, politicians in particular, use abstractions and evasive language consciously or unconsciously to confuse, distort, conceal, or avoid, or in other words, to manipulate others. An obfuscation of political discourse. We have this quote, when a country's democratic leaders lose the ability to describe reality accurately, its people become handicapped in their quest to understand and solve their problems. If thought corrupts language, or makes language, or forms language, language can also corrupt thought, just like we learned with definitions changing over time to reflect new attitudes. Euphemism is indirect, less expressive words or phrases, or sensitive ideas. It is the deliberate camouflaging of precise meaning. For example, when a lady says she's going to powder her nose, what she's actually doing is going to the ladies' room. Denotation refers to the basic dictionary meaning of a word, separate from its emotional associations. Connotation means the suggestive or associative implications beyond the literal explicit sense of the word. Let's think about how definition can help us in our written argument. Abstract terms need illustration with specific, concrete examples, and words that might be obscure to a general audience need defining so that our readers understand what we mean. For example, if you're writing an argument on a fairly scientific and technical topic, you're going to need to define terms so that all of your readers will understand without having um, any scientific background. A positives in arguments are useful allowing you to define terms, expand and emphasize idea, and show opposing points of view in the same sentence. Please turn to page 120 and complete writing assignment 9. Please post your answer in the discussion board called Exercise 9 in Module 5. This is where you get the opportunity for creating your own word. For example, you can say something like the word automagically. This is something that we use in information technology a lot, as in, oh, the computer just completed that task automagically. That is a combination of the word automatically and magically. That's just an example. So let's review the things that we covered in this chapter. We know that it is important that our readers understand the meaning of the words we use when we write. Controlling the definition of things is paramount, and it helps us frame and control our argument. Language is an abstract system of symbols and is arbitrary. We call a cat a cat because that's what we have all decided. We could have easily have decided to call a cat, you know, a bluebird. Meaning is dependent on the individual, the context, and the interpretive or language community. For example, we had the word host and all the different meanings depending on where you were using that word. Abstract language is often manipulated for a specific purpose, especially political ones. And we need to use concrete specific details to help our readers grasp our meaning.